Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this weekend's Intercom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with Navi, specifically that Navi will not have a high-performance SKU. Instead, you can think of it more along the lines of how AMD handled Polaris. Then we're going to move over to the official launch information for the Ryzen 2000 series, as the CPUs will be on store shelves in just a few days. So AMD have released all of the official information, including pricing, specifications, and so on. And then we're going to finish the video with the Xbox One and Phil Spencer, because Phil Spencer has talked about multi-generation console support for games and how long he and Microsoft believe it will take for photorealism to become the norm when it comes to real-time rendered scenes, in other words, video games. But, once again, we're going to start things out with Navi. So, currently, AMD have two distinctive set of GPU products, and this is not differentiating between mobile and desktop just for a second. Instead, we have Polaris, which, of course, debuted at the 400 series, like the 480, and it offered a roughly performance around the RX 390X type of level, and subsequently the GTX 1060 when uh, NVIDIA launched their Pascal lineup of cards. Then Vega launched a little bit later on, which was the successor to Polaris and the Vega 56 and the 64s, put out roughly the same levels of performance as the 1070 and the 1080 respectively from NVIDIA. However, there is a new rumour going around the town, and that is that the next generation mainstream Navi GPU performance will offer performance around the levels of the 1080 or the Vega 64, but crucially, in terms of pricing, it's going to be much more in line with the RX 580. So what does this mean? Well, if these rumours are accurate, instead of increasing the performance drastically for the new line of SKUs and of course having a price point to match, like let's say several hundred dollars, instead AMD wants to improve performance for the mainstream but at a good price for customers. So these rumours originate from FUDzilla. Now, it's imperative to realise that we don't know too much about Navi. We do know it is, of course, the successor to Vega. Ultimately, AMD not having the equivalent of a new Titan, especially at launch, might disappoint some, but don't forget that most likely they will be fully embracing ray tracing. After all, they have gone out multiple times in PR statements and said that not only are they supporting Vulkan and ray tracing with open source technologies, but also that they're fully on board with Microsoft and their ray tracing technologies as well. Therefore, for folks who don't necessarily want to plonk down a whole bunch of money, it could keep NVIDIA very honest in the mainstream segment. And once again, if they are supplying parts for the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox as well, AMD's GPU segment could be rather profitable. And assuming Navi is scalable, or there's another GPU that comes along shortly thereafter, it doesn't necessarily preclude AMD releasing a high-performance part, let's say six months later. They might instead just try to, bo try to bolster and really, I guess, stake down their, their offerings right now. I want to finish this segment off by just imparting that, once again, these are rumours. It's possible that in a couple of weeks' time, AMD could not only refute these, but they could also be saying, hey, you know, we're putting out a GPU that's going to absolutely crush uh, the, the high-end performance segment, and it will have, let's say, HBM, Three in it, and or it could have GDDR6 in it. These are only rumors. So until AMD make an official announcement, or until much more information leaks and we get more solid information about their their lineup, well, you get the idea. Next up, and once again sticking with AMD, and that is the second generation of Ryzen processors are primed and ready for the spotlight in the retail segment. In fact, they will hit re full retail availability. Excuse me on April 19th, but they are now available to pre-order in most retailers. So what do we have here? Well, at the high end, we have the 2700X. It boosts up to 4.3 gigahertz, and it will cost you a grand spiffy total of 330 US dollars, which is not too bad considering the levels of performance on offer. I won't go through all the specifications because we've discussed them ad nauseum, but once again, 16 threads, 8 cores, 4.35 gigahertz, assuming it's boosting all the way, it has a base clock of 3.7 gigahertz, 
and of course is built on the 12nm process. Then we have the 2700, which is slightly cheaper at 300 US dollars. Slight note, if you're going to ask me which of these is the better option, there is the TDP difference. So you have 65 versus 105, that's for the 2700 and the, and the X respectively. But what this means in real world overclocking scenarios, we don't know. The primary difference that we could see other than the TDP is the base clock and the boost clock, which runs at 4.1 for the boost versus and uh, 3.2 for the base. So obviously that is quite a bit different. If you're considering buying one of these CPUs and you can wait a couple of days, personally, I would do so and just wait and see how they overclock. Because let's say with the 1700 and the 1700X, there wasn't that much of a difference. And even the 1600 and the 1600X, oftentimes the CPU clock speed when overclocked with a decent cooler, not too much of a difference at all. Just for also clarification, there is no Ryzen, there are no Ryzen 5s which have four cores. Um, or not, sorry, no Ryzen 3s which have four cores. Instead, we are looking at only 12 thread CPUs here. So there is nothing lower than the 2600 launched. The 2600, just for clarification's sake, has 12, uh, 12 threads, six cores, 3.9 gigahertz for the boost, and it is going to retail at a really nice price, actually 200 US dollars. The X variant, um, once again, 12 and 6 for the thread and core count respectively, but it does have a much higher clock speed. It runs at 4.25 gigahertz for the boost clock and 3.6 gigahertz for the base clock, which is about 300 megahertz faster for the boost and about 200 megahertz faster for the base. Once again, if you are considering one of these parts, I would highly suggest if you're unfamiliar with, um, you know, the what I'm going to tell you by now, I would highly suggest you just wait a couple of days unless you're really sure that you just want to get like the 2700X, just wait a couple of days and see how well they overclock. These do of course run on the X300 series motherboards, but in doing so, you do lose a couple of features. Namely, PCIe bandwidth will be lower, which could be of interest if you're going to be running, let's say, multiple graphics cards. We also have a revised power design, which in theory at least should offer higher clock frequencies for the 400 series. But once again, I would advise you wait if that's something that's going to be of interest to you and possibly on the fence of buying a new motherboard or not. Wait to see what the average overclock is. And also we see the inclusion of store MI technologies, which will um, allow you to offer uh, commonly used data files, uh, and essentially the system will automatically put data onto the fastest drive, which is commonly used. So let's say the operating system, it will not require you to reinstall it. Instead, it will begin to use SSD for loading. If, for example, it was originally installed on the uh, mechanical hard drive, and then later on you installed an SSD, the system would start to optimize that on your behalf. It will be free for the X470 platform, but for other Ryzen supporting chipsets, from the, what we're hearing at the moment, it's going to cost you 20 US dollars, which is not too bad at all, really. So we're going to finish the video off with Microsoft's Phil Spencer. Specifically, he was asked numerous questions like what the future plans would be when it comes to multi-generation support of consoles and software, how long it would take for photorealism to become the normal in games, and a few other bits and bobs as well. So, starting things out with multiple console generations and support for games. He said that he believes that in a future where you have so many big games that have huge playing communities behind them, a future where you fragment that community via hardware feels like a challenge. He says that, I believe we can learn a lot from PC here. GPUs are supported until a point where there aren't enough players slash buyers to make that platform viable for developers. It should be about the players and where they want to play, end quote. It's a very interesting notion, actually. Let's say, for the sake of argument, you own a GTX 970 right now. Well, that doesn't mean that you can't play games, right? It's like, sure, your friend might own a GTX 1080, but essentially you can still play the same title. Of course, you would immediately need to admit that you have to lower resolution, probably, or level of detail in general, but you can still play the same games. Now... Microsoft have made a couple of murmurs in the past that we will see some backwards or forwards compatibility, if you will, between console generations. So let's say for the sake of argument, the new Xbox launches in 
Christmas this year. I mean, it's not going to, but let's just say it did. So let's call it the Xbox 2 along with Gears of War 5. Well, let's say you couldn't afford to buy the next Xbox, but you just bought an Xbox One X a couple of months prior. What does that mean? Well, in theory at least, you should be able to just plop the Gears of War 5 disc into your Xbox One X and Bob your uncle. In theory, you will be able to play the game, but of course there will be lower levels of graphical detail, you will have lower frame rates, probably not higher resolution, you get the idea by now. But, in theory at least, you should have the ability to still play with your friend who has just bought an Xbox 2. And that also would be rather critical as well, because... In theory, at least judging from these comments about not wanting to fragment a community, they would also want backwards compatibility between you who owns an Xbox One X and your friend who owns an Xbox Two. So that's going to be rather interesting to see how all of that plays out. And personally, I'm, I'm actually okay with that. I mean, Microsoft have been really jumping on the backwards compatibility bandwagon for a number of months now. And we often see headlines, of course, of how they've got a new game running on the, the uh, Xbox One. It's been uh, sorry, Xbox One X enhanced, or Microsoft have added yet more games for the original Xbox compatibility, or even the Xbox 360 compatibility. And you know what? I'm actually okay with that. I do feel that Microsoft need to work on other things, and you know what they are as well as I do, like exclusives. But overall, I think if they continue like this with the roadmap and making things a lot more ecosystem driven which really to be honest if you look at how the company are handling things as a whole not even just gaming like their services division you can certainly see that's how microsoft really want to lure customers in they don't want people to just be wham bam thank you ma'am they want them to be repeat they want you to feel that you can access your library of games forever in a day because ultimately that means that they as a company know that you will come back repeatedly month after month, year after year, it also makes you less tempted, let's say, if you've got an Xbox One X, to then jump over to the PlayStation. Now, it doesn't preclude you, of course, buying the PlayStation 5, but it also does encourage you to buy the next Xbox, because you know that you've got that forward and backwards compatibility, which, of course, is extremely important. So, what about photorealism? Well, this was another tweet that Phil Spencer asked, uh, sorry, answered, and he believes that it's going to take about 10 years before it's possible for photorealistic graphics to be, I wouldn't exactly say 100% indistinguishable, but pretty close to real life. He said, and I quote, yeah, 10 years is pretty reasonable. There are scenes today where the average viewer would have be hard-pressed to differentiate. Animation and lighting are still a ways off from real-time realism in a scene, in my view. I would agree with that. It's slight, you know, funny story time, but back in the days of the PlayStation 2, this is particularly the first couple of years, games definitely looked a lot better. Textures were noticeably improved. Resolution, of course, saw a large bump. Geometry detail definitely saw a large bump. But there was a conversation that my friend Stephen and I would have quite often uh, I knew a lot less about graphics technology at the time, so I'm going to keep things in the verbiage that we were using back then. But we just said, you know what, the characters just look shiny. They they don't look realistic. There, there were some impressive textures and uh, impressive lighting later on, and shadows start to, certainly start to improve in detail. But especially early on, certain games just looked very shiny. They didn't look like light would fall exactly, well, even, even slightly close to realistic. Fast forward to now, of course, and we've got some really impressive technology. We've got ambient occlusion, screen space, and all these other cool technologies, but it's still not quite right. And animation, in certain instances as well, can just look a little bit janky. It, it, it stares until even the last couple of years have been noticeably a problem, especially if you start to do the waggle thing with your character, you know, going backwards and forwards, it doesn't look quite right. But... I will say that ray tracing in particular to me is rather of interest because in theory it allows the system to much more closely approximate how light would actually interact in real time. And of course this is ultimately a limitation of raster technology and this unfortunately is going to be something that is going to take a lot of GPU performance and therefore traditional raster techniques are going nowhere fast. We're going to have those remaining in place for some time but just like Microsoft was saying regarding ray tracing, it's probable 
that we're going to have um, ray tracing kind of be interspersed with traditional rasterization techniques. But if you want to know more about that, you can check out how ray tracing works on the channel. I have, of course, put out a video regarding that. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.